chapter 9 this morning. Acts chapter 9. And we're going to read verses 1 through 16. Acts chapter 9 and verses 1 through 16. It says there, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. The conversion of the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, is possibly the greatest event in church history after the events on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. Saul was born a Jew. He tells us this in Philippians 3, of the tribe of Benjamin, Jacob's most beloved son of his 12 sons. Uh, he was raised in a culture or a society which had been largely shaped and influenced by the Greek Empire before the Romans came along. And he was able to dispute and debate with the philosophers in Athens, Acts chapter 17. And he was able to claim all the uh, privileges of Roman citizenship, which he tells us in Acts chapter 16. And so in a way, Saul was a representative of every man, at least every man uh, at his time, in his time. And he understood the three worlds of religion, of society, and government. But he was a bad man. He was so zealous to defend the religion of Moses, he obtained letters from the chief priest, as it says in verse 2, to arrest and imprison anyone daring to preach Jesus Christ, especially Christians preaching Jesus Christ in the synagogues. He wanted to shut that down. But the Lord Jesus himself intervened to effect the salvation of of Saul, Saul of Tarsus. And, and he ended up changing the world by that man's salvation. Amen. So I call this sermon, When a Bad Man Gets Saved. Amen. When a bad man, of course, when I say a bad man, I hope you understand, I, I know the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Romans uh, 3.12 says, for there is none that doeth good, no, not one. But I mean, 
um, so one, one who's extraordinarily bad. He's worse than most. I hope you understand that distinction. How many of you recognize the name John Newton? Just let me see your sh a show of hands. Everyone should, although you might not at first. How many of you remember what he was or what he did before he got saved? How many of you know the song that he wrote? All right, let me bring you back up to speed. John Newton worked on a slave ship in the 18, early 1800s, uh, going to Africa, kidnapping black Africans, and selling them into slavery throughout the British Empire. And once he got saved, he trusted Christ to save him. Uh, he became a preacher and renounced everything he had done before. You know, uh, forcing someone into slavery was a capital offense in the Old Testament. Exodus 21 and verse 16 says, He that stealeth a man and selleth him, he shall surely be put to death. And, but, and, and once he got saved and turned his life to God, he wrote, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That was, who knows how many people have been blessed by that song. Probably the most famous song in all of Christian history. But um, that's the song of a, of a soul, the cry of a soul that's been set free from the weight and the guilt and the shame of its own sin. But before I get, I want to preach to you about the Apostle Paul's conversion. But before I get to him, let me tell you about three other uh, bad men who turned their lives over to Jesus Christ. William Murray, some of you remember his name. William Murray is one who I would categorize as having been a bad man. He was the son of the famous atheist in America named Madeline Murray O'Hare. When he was a teenage boy, his mother used him and his younger brother as plaintiffs in a famous court case called Murray versus Curlett. And uh, she claimed that her son's going to public school and having to hear a, a sort of a prayer read over the loudspeaker um, and then having to be taught moral lessons drawn from the Bible, that was unconstitutional. They were forcing religion on her sons. And of course, the, the, the sort of generic, the prayer rather, that, that was offered in many public schools, excuse me, was very um, generic. It was not very specific. It was, you know, pray for our safety, help us to be good students, become good citizens, you know, one of those in thy name, amen. So it was very nonspecific, but, but it doesn't take much to get under the skin of a diehard atheist. And so the Supreme Court of the United States agreed with her. And in 1963, they forced all public schools in America to stop reciting any prayers over the loudspeaker and stop using the Bible as uh, the source of great moral uh, lessons on virtue and uh, good citizenship and so forth. And from that point on, her, she became known as the most hated woman in America. And I think she actually liked that moniker. But uh, after that victory, William Murray and his brother helped their mother to found the American Atheist Organization. And uh, they did everything they could to stop any uh, religious expressions in public, especially by Christians. They hated the Bible, they hated God, and they hated uh, anything that reminded them of God. But. William Murray began to see the disparity between his mother's bitterness and her, her anger and the general kindness of Christians he would encounter and began to see these things are so incompatible one with the other. And in 1980, William Murray got saved, gave his life to Jesus Christ, became a Baptist minister. And of course, his mother immediately renounced him, had wanted nothing more to do with him. His mother, his younger brother, and his own daughter, who had been poisoned by her grandma, they all turned their back on him. And uh, 
But since that time, he's been working to try and undo the damage that his mother had brought about on the United States. Much of that damage he had a hand in executing. You know, that's a great burden of guilt for someone to carry around, even as a Christian, to try to undo the damage which had been done here in America. Peter Hitchens is another man I would have to have classified as a bad man. He's the younger brother of the late atheist Christopher Hitchens. Uh, he came to despise religion in all of its forms, just like his older brother had done, and uh, was for years a member of the International Socialist Party in Great Britain. He says that at one time he burned the copy of the Bible he had, uh, totally rejecting it. And he and his brother are and were very gifted uh, public speakers and writers. And you can imagine the damage that a good writer could do to society if people read his columns or read his books uh, to destroy everything that's noble and worthwhile and virtuous within a country. But about 30 years ago, Peter Hitchens came under conviction about his own sins after seeing a painting by a French um, artist depicting the Last Judgment. Souls being cast into hell into torment. And he, he wondered to himself, could it possibly be true? Everything he had maybe heard as a young boy in church and had walked away from, could it possibly be true? And if it was true, he knew he was going to end up in the wrong place. And uh, he writes about his turning to the Lord Jesus, his conversion back to, to Jesus Christ in a, a book in 2010 called The Rage Against God and why atheists are so adamant uh, uh, pressing their point on people and forcing uh, you to accept their opinion but not wanting to consider yours. And since then, he, be he has become one of the most sought after conservative commentators on news and politics and morality in the United Kingdom. And by the way, a great proponent of the King James Bible he writes about the King James Bible and he says this, it is not simply a translation, but a poetic translation written to be read aloud, to lodge in the mind and to disturb the temporal with the haunting sound of the eternal. That's very uh, beautifully put. One more bad man I want to tell you about. Michael Franzese was a true life mobster he was a capo in the uh, uh, Colombo crime family, New York City. Um, these guys have these nicknames that attach to them, usually based on some quirk, some personal habit they have, and that becomes, that, that turns into a nickname that they carry for the rest of their lives in the mob. And he was known as the Yuppie Don because he was young and good looking in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, and his associates were the Gambino and the Genovese crime families uh, uh, in the different boroughs of New York. And um, his crime dealings put him in contact on numerous occasions with uh, a very famous mobster called John Gotti. He was known as the Dapper Don because he was a sharp dresser uh, and sometimes known as the Teflon Don because no matter what charges they tried to level against him, his attorneys were successful in getting him off. So, uh, and, and some of these other associates that Michael Franzese uh, grew up with and lived with and worked with went by these crazy names. Paul, Big Paul Castellano. Lawrence Champagne Larry Carozzo. Anthony Fat Tony Salerno and uh, Francesco Frankie the Wop Manzo. Like I say, these guys, they, they, they get these unique nicknames attached to them and that's what they carry throughout the rest of their lives in organized crime. He helped to organize the Russian mob, the Russian mafia rather, in New York City as well. His life was portrayed in a 1990 movie called Goodfellas. 
And uh, you can see him describing his life in the mob uh, on a documentary called Inside the American Mob, currently on Netflix. And um, his, but, but in 1985, he was sentenced to a 10-year prison term for um, extortion and counterfeiting and uh, a f number of other crimes. In 1987, he began to rethink his life and began reading the Bible. And it wasn't long, eventually he turned to Jesus Christ and was born again and trusted Christ to save him. And he decided to walk away from his life in organized crime, an, an act, a feat which is almost impossible to do. It's almost impossible to say, I'm gonna turn my back on it and walk away from it and never be involved in it again because the mob will murder you to keep you silent about how they operate. But he was able to do it. His own father had put a contract out on him. His father had brought him into the mob. His dad, of course, according to the documentary I watched, is in his uh, early 90s, still in prison for, for the rest of his life, unless he's passed away uh, since then. But his own father had put a, a hit on him because he didn't trust his son to be honest. And yet the, uh, the other mobsters, and, and no murder could take place unless the, what they call the commission, the top echelons of all these crime families agreed that so-and-so needs to be silenced. And yet they didn't. They didn't murder him for walking away from his life of crime. And the FBI shakes their heads wondering, how in the world does a guy succeed in doing that? Well, with with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible, right? His life and his testimony were depicted in a, a 2017 movie, uh, not The Godfather, but God the Father. And now he um, is a, a very sought after Christian speaker giving his testimony and works with youth organizations trying to keep kids from getting involved in crime and, and making something productive out of their lives. But let me say, God is in the business of saving sinners. And um, it, it, almost the worse that someone is, the more God can and wants to save them. And so let's get to the Apostle Paul. We read the 16 verses there in Acts chapter 9. And the first thing I want you to notice today is the surprise at Saul's conversion. Let's read verses 1 and 2 again. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. To be sure, some sinners have such a defiant personality. They've, they're set in their own religious ways so strongly that rather than their religion teaching them to, you know, love your fellow man, their religion makes them want to kill their fellow man, wants to murder them. And some sinners seem to be so far gone in their religious uh, bias and their crimes and their sins and their anger toward the world. You might ask, how in the world could someone like that ever get saved? You tell yourself, there's no way in the world that guy will ever soften his heart and admit that he's a sinner who needs to be forgiven. That attitude seemed to be the attitude that Ananias had. Look down at verses 13 and 14 again. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. Uh, Ananias was asking God, are we talking about the same man? Are you sure you're talking about the same guy, Lord? He couldn't see how such a man would ever turn to Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 32 Verse 27 is a good verse. Everyone should mark this down or memorize it. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything 
too hard for me? And the, the obvious answer is no. God had to ask Abraham, is there anything too hard for the Lord, Genesis 18, 14, when he thought that he and his wife Sarah were too old to have children? Uh, believers need to stop doubting God's ability and start trusting God's ability. That's why William Carey could say, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. And I don't think it's wrong for us to ask great things of God. Uh, no doubt Paul had himself in mind when he later wrote, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Romans 5 verse 20. The more disgusting a human being I was, the more grace God showed in saving me. And once you begin living a life as a believer in Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter if you were saved as a small child <clears throat> or saved as a, a grown-up having lived a long life of, of wickedness and, and crime. You come to the same conclusion that I'm not deserving of God's mercy. I don't deserve his grace, his kindness. Why he would show enough grace to save my soul when I've disappointed him and failed him so many times, even as a believer. You wonder, why, was, why does God put up with me? And yet the wonderful fact of the matter is he does. Thank God for that. Excuse me. But the Bible says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Thou showest loving kindness unto thousands and recompensest the iniquity of the fathers into the bosom of their children after them. In other words, your family's wicked and awful legacy doesn't have to be yours necessarily unless you reject God's mercy. <laughs> Jeremiah 32, verses 17 and 18. John W. Peterson seemed to, to capture this in his, probably his most famous song. It took a miracle to put the stars in space. It took a miracle to hang the world in place. But when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and grace. Saul's conversion was both a miracle and a surprise. Next, look at verses 3 through 6 again. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. <clears throat> and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Secondly, notice the style of Saul's conversion. Now, what I mean by that is that the method, the manner in which it takes place. When I got saved as a young boy, um, I knew that God was speaking to my heart. I sensed that much. But there was no voice out of the sky. There was no great light that knocked me to the ground. And I suspect uh, none of those things happened when you got saved either. But they certainly happened when Saul of Tarsus turned to Jesus Christ. Uh, the Lord came down personally to effect and make sure this man got saved. This man's salvation was going to be very important to the Lord. Uh, someone might think, well, that sounds almost Calvinistic that he gets involved in bringing someone and forcing someone to get saved. He didn't force him to get saved at all. Not at all. But his, his will still had to yield to the will of God in order for his salvation to be made complete. Um, notice how he answers God, verses 4 and 5. It says there, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. The daily prodding, the provoking, uh, the reminders every day 
of what he was doing. Christ had warned his apostles, they shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. John 16, verse 2. And Saul certainly wanted all believers in Christ to be dead if he could. By the way, sometimes some Christians have the mistaken idea that Saul murdered Christians. Saul didn't murder or bring about the murder of any Christians. He would have liked to, I suppose, if he could. This is how angry and bitter he was. But he had authority to arrest and imprison. And we know that he, he didn't bring about the death or, the, or cause the murder of a Christian because in Acts chapter 11, he says, if I have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. He knew that, that murder was a capital offense. He knew that murder would be worthy of the death penalty. And he knew that he was innocent of that much. So just a, that's a bit of trivia clarification. Earlier in Acts chapter 5, when the apostles were beaten and um, rebuked by the angry, <coughs> the angry Jewish elders, it says they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, verse 40 there. In verse 41 there, we read, And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. They consider it to be an honor to suffer a little bit for the one who had once suffered for them on the cross of Calvary. Every Christian ought to look at Jesus Christ that way. Every time Saul arrested someone for preaching Christ, he saw how patiently they took his abuse and um, it was a rebuke to him. His conscience was eating him up. And he knew that what he was doing was wrong. You know what we call that? We call that conviction. He knew that what he was doing was wrong. He was convicted of his sins. And so it was natural that he should eventually surrender himself to Jesus Christ when Christ speaks to him. But the Lord Jesus knew he would do things for him that no other man could do at the time or in the world. He made sure that this energetic, aggressive, overzealous Jew got saved, got grounded and established in the faith before some charismatic or some cult leader came along and, you know, offered him their free literature and, and corrupted the seed that had just sprung up to new life. They do that, you know. They like to do that. But besides the surprise of his conversion, uh, uh, pay attention also to the style of his conversion. Thirdly, lastly today, I want you to consider the significance of Saul's conversion. Verses 15 and 16 again. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. The Bible says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. James says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing, that, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. James 1, verses 2 and 3. Peter says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing had happened unto you. 1 Peter 4.12 You should expect the world around you to be hostile to the holy gospel of Jesus Christ because it's a reproof to them. It's a rebuke to them. It portrays Christ as the most holy, virtuous, righteous, lovely, um, compassionate man who's ever lived in the face, on the face of the earth in all of human history. And it shows how small and weak and uh, uh, wicked they are by contrast. And they don't like that contrast. They don't like that comparison being laid out in front of them. They'll either, they'll either walk away from it saying, I want nothing to do with it, or they'll join some religion and say, well, maybe I can work hard and measure up to it and try to match his goodness. They can't. Uh, don't fool yourself into thinking that being a Christian is an easy life or a convenient life, a carefree life. And... Um, 
But God was getting ready to do things with, with the new Apostle Paul that he wouldn't do with anyone else in the world and probably will never be able to do with us. Without him, we would never have the local New Testament church. You know that? Without the Apostle Paul, we wouldn't understand the offices of the local church. Without the Apostle Paul, we wouldn't understand the ordinances of the church, the Lord's Supper, the water baptism of a new convert. Without Paul, we wouldn't understand the roles of men and women in the local assembly. Without him, we wouldn't understand the mystery of the body of Christ, Jews and Gentiles now joined together. Without him, we wouldn't understand the mystery of iniquity, which now operates, preparing the world for the uh, Antichrist and the eventual coming of Jesus Christ and the catching away of the saints. Do you know that the Apostle Paul became the most widely read, the most widely circulated author in the history of the world? We don't think of it that way. You know, the Bible is famous for a lot of things. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, chapters 5, 6, and 7. Probably the most oft-repeated and oft-read sermon ever preached in the history of the world. We don't give the Bible credit when it deserves it. And the Apostle Paul, undoubtedly the most widely circulated published author in the history of the world. Uh, he is the teacher of the New Testament church, not Simon Peter. Paul wrote 14 books of the New Testament. Paul wrote, or Peter wrote two. And in one of his, in his one of his epistles, he refers to the the writings of the Apostle Paul as a scripture. It was the Apostle Paul who rebuked Simon Peter in Galatians chapter two for being a hypocrite when he was around Jews and then acting differently when he was around Gentiles. Imagine that. Imagine a traveling evangelist having to rebuke the supposed first pope. It's very bad form. You think he'd be called into the Vatican to give an account for himself, but so the Apostle Paul is the teacher of the church. It wasn't Simon Peter. Virtually every church, both Catholic and Protestant, every denomination, Baptists, Pentecostals, Lutherans, Methodists, Nazarenes, Anglicans, Presbyterians, and all the rest, every sort of peripheral group on the edge that, that call themselves Christians, but we know that they're not, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, even the, the Church of Christ, uh, Seventh-day Adventists, they're sort of on the edge there, the sort of the periphery. They call themselves Christian, but even those groups and all the others try to base what they teach on the writings of the Apostle Paul, one way or another. But God opened doors to the Apostle Paul that most of us will never have opened to us. Most of us won't give our testimony to the president of the U.S. or to the ranking members of the U.S. Congress or to the U.S. Supreme Court justices. But Paul gave his testimony before the governor Felix and the king Agrippa, Acts chapters 24 and 25. He uh, debated with the Greek philosophers in Athens, Acts chapter 17, and he testified to the pagan Gentiles on the, all, on the island of Melita, Acts chapter 28. And he tried repeatedly to preach Christ to his fellow Jews, most of whom rejected him. Now I'm going to, bring this to begin to bring this to a close. He said about his fellow Jews, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge, Romans 10, verse 2. He could say that because he had once been the same way as they were. When a bad man gets saved, he wants to win those to Christ who he once associated with, those he used to be like. One of the friends of our church ministry, his prayer card is on the bulletin board in the back, Dave Spurgeon. He was a bad man. He was a member of the, the Outlaws, one of the four notorious um, biker gangs in the U.S. listed on as domestic terrorists by the FBI. God got a hold of him 
while he was sitting in jail, saved him, cleaned up his act. Uh, he now wears a suit and tie and a clean haircut and has a good family and travels around the country as an evangelist trying to win people Jesus Christ. But don't you know, underneath that suit and tie, he's probably covered with tattoos from his older, older years, early years, rather. And uh, he wants to win those kinds of guys to Jesus Christ if God opens a door and allows him to do so. And Paul wrote about himself saying, But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preaches the faith which once he destroyed. Galatians 1.23 John Newton became a preacher and preached the faith which once he rejected and rebelled at. Peter Hitchens now defends the faith which once he mocked and wanted nothing to do with. Michael Franzis now proclaims the faith he had no interest in growing up as a Catholic in uh, New York City. And William Murray now preaches the faith which once he literally sought to destroy. And let me bring this to a close. Um, Glory to God when he saves a bad man. But let me say, glory to God when he saves any man.